Hey, thanks for checking out the Solid Verbal. Now would be a great time to subscribe to the channel for college football content all off season long. All right, Dan, joining us now, titled newspaper sports writer turned founder publisher <laughs> of the web's number one Maryland Terrapin site from InsideMDSports.com, Jeff Ehrman. Sir, welcome to the Solid Verbal. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. So look, we're we're doing this like series of episodes now where we're talking about how teams can take the next step. And for Maryland, Dan and I kind of just vaguely defined it as eight wins or a steady eight wins. It's notable on the Maryland side that they got there last year after the bowl game, uh, fell a little bit short during the regular season, but it was a one win improvement from 2021. Is that a fair assessment? of Maryland football to get to eight wins consistently. What do you view as the next step? I think that's a fair assessment. You know, unlike most college football fans, Maryland fans aren't de delusional about it. They don't expect to be competing for Big Ten titles every year, going to the college football play. Not that they wouldn't love that, but you have to be realistic about it. You know, they it's been a down cycle for the program the past 20 years when Mike Loxley took over five years ago. They had Law had losing records four or five years in a row. You know, they had obviously the uh, tragic death of Jordan McNair and the, the ensuing controversy, DJ Dirk inspiring. So long story short, you know, they I think when you combine that background with the fact that they're going up against Ohio State and Michigan and Penn State every single year, which will change soon with, you know, the the um, elimination of divisions, which will help them a lot. But as of right now, I think most fans would be thrilled to get to that eight win level on a yearly basis. You, you mentioned Mike Loxley stepping in, um, you know, the last two seasons, I think, have have certainly represented an improvement in the Maryland football program. From your vantage point, what's working? What's what's not working? What is what does he need to improve in order to maybe get to that next echelon? Uh, I would say what's working is recruiting. You know, recruiting has obviously improved quite a bit. That's no surprise. That's what Loxley's been known for his whole career. Uh, the offense has significantly improved. I think if you're trying to point to something that's not working, the defense has really just been perennially toward that bottom tier in the Big Ten since they joined the conference. Uh, they've lacked the depth and the size in the trenches, which, as we all know, is, is half the battle in the Big Ten. They did make, you know, pretty significant, I think, improvements last year under Brian Williams. Uh, it was his first year as their defensive coordinator. I think most people view him as kind of a rising star. So they did make some incremental improvements there. That, there's reason for hope there. But, you know, looking at the big picture, that's, to me, been the clear weakness, you know, since they joined the conference. Does there seem to be confident, confidence, excuse me, in, in Mike Loxley as, obviously, as a recruiter? Definitely. As an in-game coach, as a, a head coach preparing his team to win winnable games, it seems that, you know, you mentioned Maryland, you know, these past few years, of course, having Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State in the uh, in the division. But is this a, a team, is this a program that always feels like it's ready to win those tight games that are winnable against teams that are similarly or even lesser talented? Yeah, I mean, that's a legit question, especially when you look at last year with all the penalties. They're one of the most penalized teams in the country. You know, uh, Mike, you know, spoke after all the games. We got to get this fixed. You know, they weren't able to get it fixed. So that that is a legitimate question. On the flip side, though, you also have to give credit for competing with those top tier Big Ten teams last year. You know, every single year you could you could predict it. You know, if they, when they played Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan, they were probably going to get trounced. Last year, you know, they played Michigan really close on the road. A few different bounces go their way, and they had a chance yeah. to win that. And then at home against Ohio State, you know, that went right down to the wire. So I think he's shown some improvement in that area, but it's still, like you said, it's something you need to improve upon, not only against the powerhouses, but but again, like those teams you mentioned who are kind of your peers in the conference, like a Purdue, which was a 50-50 game. They made some mistakes and lost. Um, right down the wire last year if not then you have nine wins and things look even better is there a position group you mentioned the trenches is the trajectory somewhat promising that you know either the offensive or, or defensive line groupings will be deeper and more talented and, and better able to to hang with some of the the better programs in the conference 
I think on the defensive line, it's possible that you're relying on a few unproven commodities, but the defensive line was solid but not great last year. Offensive line to me is the biggest question mark they have. You know, they lost four multi-year starters. Then they had two more guys, one of whom uh, was going to start, Mason Lunsford, a guard, transferred to LSU. Colton Deary, a center who was probably going to start, uh, he transferred as well. So they're relying on a lot of transfers, a lot of unknown commodities there. They need to probably get a few more guys. They definitely need to get a few more guys out of the transfer portal there. So the offensive line, to me, if anything potentially could hold them back this season, it's that. How is, I mean, you mentioned recruiting being a strength, but how is recruiting in terms of balancing high school and portal? Does there seem to be an evolving vision? Is there, do you have confidence that this is a program that knows what it's doing and has a plan to get to that eight or nine win level? Yeah, I think they know what they're doing. They have, you know, he's hired some guys recently, you know, I think the Josh Gad is hired. He's a really good recruiter. He'll help. Um, they did. They also lost a few. There was some turnover in the off season, but you know, I think the ambition is basically to be in that top thirty range every year in high school recruiting, um, which is good if you're a Maryland. That puts you right in that top half of the Big Ten. And then you know, add transfers. This year they added. I think uh, last I checked, our rankings twenty four seven Sports had their class, their transfer class number thirteen in the country, which is pretty good when you're in Maryland. And you know, so much of it comes down to NIL. And, you know, a lot of kids want to go to the big names. So they, they brought in a really strong transfer class. So you know, I think the recruiting obviously it still could get a little better. But based on where they sit in the ecosystem, it's it's been pretty solid. You mentioned Josh Gaddis. They also bring in Kevin Sumlin. Is there any concern from you that there are too many cooks in the kitchen? No, not at all. I think um, Sumlin is a guy who is, you know, just about out of coaching, basically. He's yeah, often yeah. in the USFL and. Um, so I think for him, this is um, a window to get back into the game more so than a, you know, I'm the guy kind of mindset. Gaddis too was a little bit on the downswing, you know, two years ago, you know, the national the Frank Broyles winner at Michigan. And then last year kind of unceremoniously bumped out of Miami. So I don't think, you know, when you combine that with he and Loxley had a little bit of beef in the past, right? you know, Loxley is a forgiving guy, but he's also... Yeah. The guy who, you, you know, you, people, I don't use like this phrase, too. he's alpha man. He's alpha, so he's not going to hire this guy without him fully knowing his role. So I don't see I don't see any sort of ego issues. What What's the vision look like post Talia at quarterback? Well, they got a couple guys. Billy Edwards uh, transferred from Wake Forest last year, ended up playing, you know, a pretty decent amount just because of injuries to Tunga Vailoa. And actually looked pretty good. I mean, they really liked him at Wake Forest. Uh, he runs. He's a bigger, more physical guy. He's not as hesitant to run. So he's more of a read option kind of guy. Can do a lot of things with his feet and has a pretty decent arm. Whether he can ever become a passer like Talia, that, that's probably a long shot. But, can, you know, I think he's got a chance to be a Big Ten starter. And then they've got another kid named Cam Edge uh, who came in a year ago, graduated from high school early. He was a Four-star recruited to math early in his career. Stock dipped a little bit. Uh, ended up committing to Maryland, and, and from everything I've heard out of the spring, out of spring ball, they really liked what they saw. How does Maryland feel about its place within the Big Ten? Obviously, this is a, a program who makes the move a number of years ago, but doesn't necessarily fit the geographic footprint. And now we're going even further west, farther west, excuse me, with USC and UCLA. How, do, how does Maryland see itself in terms of? being positioned to potentially, you know, win those eight or nine games a year with added quality to the conference coming soon? I think they see themselves. They, they see why, you know, there's no reason we can't be a Michigan State kind of program. We're not going to be Ohio State. We're probably not going to be Penn State. There's no reason we can't be a, a Michigan State or maybe like a better version of Purdue. There's so much talent in the area. Everybody knows that. Every major school comes into the DMV to recruit players. Uh, it's a great media market, so they have a lot of things going for them. But at the same time, you know, culturally, you, you're it's so hard to catch up on these these schools like Ohio State and Penn State and Michigan, where it's just it's a statewide religion. It's not a statewide right. religion in, in Maryland. If anything, Maryland basketball is. Um, so you know, I think they see themselves as 
the, I think on the basketball side, not to bring basketball, people say okay. sleeping giant, sleeping giant all the time on the football side, like sleeping big dude, you know, like <laughs> not, not quite giant, but a power people, forward. Yeah, yeah. 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 They have the, yeah, there you go. They have the, they have the ingredients to be a lot better than they've been. And they've shown progression the past two years, you know, it's 15 wins, two years combined is the most they've had in more than a decade. So I think that, people feel optimistic that they can make that move to be in that second tier of the Big Ten. They're competing with a number of the, the schools you mentioned, obviously within the Big Ten, but a number of schools outside of the Big Ten who come to that area to recruit. Do you get a sense that the administration, that the powers that be, that the money people care enough to win eight, nine games a season? Are, is the investment there in facilities, in analysts, in support staff, to compete on that level with who they're recruiting and competing on the field against? Yeah, that was a big question for many years. The yeah, answer is probably no. I think now they're inching more toward being able to say yes on that. Um, you know, Damon Evans, the AD, he, he's more of a football guy by nature. Obviously, you guys know he played at Georgia, was the AD there. So he's a football guy by nature. He's fully invested. You know, they just gave Mike Loxley a big raise. It's going to average about $6 million during the final few years of the deal. So, you know, that's up from $2.6 million a few years ago where he was the lowest paid coach in the Big Ten. So there's an investment there. There's been an investment in staffing. You know, the one question mark, the bigger question mark to me is the NIL piece. If, if the arms race just continues at the rate that it's at right now, these schools have so many boosters and so many different avenues to raise money, whereas for Maryland football, it's a tough go. So that that's the bigger financial question to me than the school's commitment. How often do you forget that Maryland's in the Big Ten now? <laughs> well, I have to, you know, I'm required to obsess about this stuff all day, <laughs> every day, so... I don't really forget, um, but there are definitely some fans they will still tweet at me or, you know, post on our Facebook page or message boards or whatever, like, we shouldn't have left the ACC or <laughs> we can fix this, but I'm like, let it go. You know, it's, it's, it's long over. And you know what? They got really lucky with that. Look how many schools are out there sure. watching the, the development of developments of conference realignment and would give anything to be in the Big Ten where you just have insane amounts of money pouring in you know, two or three times as much as you have in the ACC. So, you know, I get it. The biggest thing to me is you don't have a rival in either sport. Right. And it's hard to see, you know, over the years, I'm sure something will d develop organically, but it's not there. And it's been, you know, it's been a while now, almost a decade. So that to me is, I, I get that. I get the nostalgia, but uh, no, I don't, I don't forget that. My my counterpoint, by the way, is if Maryland were still in the ACC, they would have been winning so many games <laughs> on the football field. It has been an incredible era to be merely pretty good at football in the ACC as we're coming off of a, a Duke season where like, yeah, they could have just won 10 games if a couple of things had bounced their way. So that's the only other counterpoint. But yeah, your point's well taken. Yeah, that's spot on. And many fans have said that yeah, I've seen that it's, if we were in the ACC, we could have won two more games. And it's it's 100 percent true. You know, the ACC has become so mediocre for the most part, whereas in the Big Ten, even the, you know, even the middle tier schools are still recruiting at a higher level. They're still fully invested. Yep. So uh, but I think the flip side of that, like I said, is now that the divisions are going to be done away with pretty soon. Uh, that will make it a little more of a meritocracy now because you won't have to, you know, you'll get a little, because the West, as you guys know, is so much weaker every single year. It's like that period of the NBA for 20 years straight where the, where the West was, you know, 10 times better than the East. Yeah. And it's kind of like, it's, it's been basically like that. So erasing that, I think, will help their results. In the spirit of this whole episode where we're talking about getting to the next level and we've defined, I guess, eight wins as as the next level for Maryland. Um, we're not doing an over under show, but Maryland's over under is seven wins. I looked at the schedule, Jeff, they open with Towson. They play Charlotte. They play Virginia. They play at Michigan state. They play Indiana on back to back to back to back to back weeks to open up the season. It's not inconceivable that Maryland is five and zero going to Ohio state first weekend of October. They only would need to win two more games the rest of the way, it does get tougher with Penn State and Michigan, and there's a road game at Nebraska, at Rutgers. Like, you could see a situation in which they end up falling short of that seven. I have to imagine, though, you look at seven and feel pretty good about that. 
yeah, you've got to feel good about that. I think if you don't get to seven, it's it's a fairly big disappointment. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like the opening of the schedule, like you said, if you're not three and one, four and one, and whatever it might be, then something's gone wrong. The, the question with them and the wins totals is always, can you pull off that one big upset right. that's going to swing things in your favor, whether it's Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State, Wisconsin. They haven't been able to do that year after year. You know, even if you take care of business against those other teams, if you're going to overachieve, you're, you're usually going to have to pull off at least one decent size upset. So can you finally do that? Because, you know, they've come close. They came close last year in those two games I mentioned, Michigan and Ohio State, but that's just not been part of the equation so far. Got to book Texas every year. Got to get Texas <laughs> on the schedule every year. Get that, that own, just balloon that schedule up, that win total up. <sighs> it's just that easy, Ty. It is. Jeff Ehrman, um, where can we find your fine work? Uh, you can find me at InsideMDSports.com or on Twitter at Jeff underscore E-R-M-A-N-N. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom, and we'll have to talk soon. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jeff.